Well, good morning, everyone. And as we start off today, we're just looking here at a map put out by the National Weather Service out of Lincoln, Illinois, showing the uh, historic rainfall event that happened uh, yesterday. Kind of storms continued to repeatedly follow a uh, stretched out frontal boundary from Peoria all the way down through Effingham and eventually down here into southeastern Illinois, where some locations saw uh, over 10 inches of rainfall. I got a chance to drive through some of this yesterday, too. There's quite a bit of crop damage, too, from very strong winds in this corridor. Now, just for perspective, if you're not from this area, this is a very productive part of Illinois from 74 to 72 down here to Interstate 70. That particular corridor uh, produces a, a lot of corn. So some places this rain was extremely beneficial, but there was some damage down here in southeastern Illinois. Now, when we think about this just kind of on a grand scale, I, I made this map using uh, the HPS data, and I linked that in today's report just so you can see it. I get a lot of data from this uh, particular site, and I, I map it for you all the time. But what you're looking at here is a 14-day percent of normal precipitation. And what we're concerned about here is that we've now seen one, uh, two, and then it's not on this map yet because it was yesterday, but that third event right in through here where we could kind of classify each of these events as a, a thousand-year rainfall event, so extremely wet. But I, as I look at it, I'm still concerned about these other regions. Like notice we're still exceptionally hot and very dry in Texas. And there's a large portion here that stretches that's missed out on some of this rain. Now we had some isolated storms yesterday in Nebraska, some that came through parts of like Sioux Falls uh, as well that are really helping out those areas. Uh, but there's a lot of holes still to fill in in this region, including parts of the Southern Plains, despite that front that sagged through here uh, last week. Also, pockets throughout New England and even in the southeast, we're going to have to have a quick discussion about that this morning, too, as we go forward in this forecast. Now, the southwest monsoon is still on, and it's still quite strong, and I don't see that slowing down. But one thing I'm thinking about here is I kind of highlighted a region on this map which shows cumulative downward solar flux. In other words, how much of the sun's light gets down to the surface. And what it really shows you is in the cooler colors where there's been more clouds and in the warmer colors where there's been less clouds compared to normal. So when we look back over the last month, I just try to identify an area where we might be seeing some fungal pressure. Um, this is not an area of expertise for me. So I, I hope that maybe I can get some feedback on this to see if there are regions in through here with the uh, increased cloud cover that locally heavy rains, the high humidity levels near the surface um, have increased uh, fungal pressure. But certainly when we kind of examine the bigger picture here, it's kind of once again that discussion of who's had the rain and who's missed it. So we need to see if this upcoming forecast is going to start to fill in some of the gaps in the western corn belt. Are we going to see better storm chances in the southern plains? And what about pockets throughout New England? Okay. All right, just here in the last uh, 48 hours, I just wanted to show you that stripe of extremely heavy rainfall through here. We've had no trouble opening the Gulf of Mexico, and that's going to be a critical part of the story that I'm going to share with you. A lot of isolated storms down here in, in parts of the lower Mississippi River Valley. Throughout the western Corn Belt and Plains, there have been isolated storms, but we're going to see if we can t take the, the moisture that's coming out of the southwest monsoon, including a little shortwave that's sitting right here, and pull this this piece of the jet stream into the, the, the Midwest here later this week. Uh, it's interesting how the southwest monsoon is going to team up with a low that's going through Canada to increase those rainfall chances. I'll explain more in just a second here. But first, I do want to look at this morning at our latest satellite data. So this was just as the sun was rising. We are watching a front sliding right in through this area, which could increase the severe storm threat. But yesterday, if we just go back in the overnight, there is, there's yesterday afternoon. Take note of some of the large wildfires that have shown up here in the Pacific Northwest, really in parts of Montana. I, also, I include in today's reports the new smoke forecast for that as well. But you can see as the sun was setting last night, some of the big clusters of storms showing up here in parts of South Dakota. And then overnight, that's along that frontal boundary that I'm going to be watching very carefully today for the risk of increased storm threat. So Storm Prediction Center has identified this corridor and through here, extending from Ontario through Michigan down into Illinois and Missouri. And if we just take a look at what the high-res models are suggesting, here we go. This is starting about midday today, getting through this evening. And you can see that along that front, there could be a, a pretty sizable frontal squall line that sets up here. The issue with this is that it's going to deliver some heavy rain over to places that don't need another drop right here in this part of Illinois, as we kind of talked about at the beginning. 
The models did also produce storms that rolled right along the lower Mississippi River Valley here, uh, like the, through Memphis and a little bit farther to the south there uh, tonight into tomorrow morning. So we're going to watch that as well. But then as we get into the day on uh, Thursday, let's actually stop this Thursday afternoon. A lot of scattered convection here, and that's a major part of what I'm about to share with you that's going to happen into this section of the United States. Because another front, it's right there, starts to show up on Friday morning and presses through. See it here? And it's going to press through the upper Midwest, northern plains, and this is part of the southwestern monsoon that's popping out there that's going to ride on that front. Now let me explain to you where this is going to go. By the time we get into this weekend, we have a large subtropical high that's sitting here. And the flow around it is just pumping in the moisture like this. We've had these lows that have curled up into the eastern part of Canada. And what's going to happen is we're going to get this flow that's coming around like this and up like that and over. And it's going to produce very slow moving fronts right in through this area. And that's going to be the, the lifting mechanism that's going to trigger a lot of thunderstorm development. I'm going to show you that looking at the European model. So we've already seen through Wednesday into Thursday. Let's park this right here Friday afternoon. So see the isolated storm complexes we expect? Here's that next low that's going to bring its front, linking it up with the southwest monsoonal flow. And by the time we get into Friday night and Saturday morning, getting into Saturday afternoon and evening, now working our way into Sunday morning, afternoon and evening, do you see how slowly that front progresses while this whole region is opened to Gulf moisture and a lot of th thunderstorm activity? This front sweeps through Sunday into Monday and presses farther to the east on Tuesday into Wednesday and finally clears the Carolinas into the southeast next Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And so what we're concerned about here is how much rain this brings in. Now, to be honest, if I, if I could make a forecast to verify, I would love to see this map showing precipitation anomalies over the next seven days verify. I'd love to fill in some of the holes in here as well. But this is a pretty broad extent of some heavier rains. What has to happen is about a week from now, we need to assess how well these rains performed to know what our drought stress looks like going forward into the rest of the month. But here's another way to look at it. This is the probability of getting an inch of rain over the next 10 days. Feel free to pause the video and have a closer look. We continue to see the southwestern ridge you know, s sitting here and developing as we go into the middle of the month. What will be very important to watch is how deep this trough on the eastern side becomes because that could indicate better chances of rainfall in through this area as fronts sag just like we saw at the end of July. If that ridge backs up farther and farther to the west, that will be another threat. That would be increasing the flood threat over a place that's already been very wet as of late. So if we just stitch it all together and say, what do the next 15 days look like? This really shows you that the pieces. There's the southwest monsoon. Whoops, sorry. Uh, there we go. There's the southwest monsoon coming through here. You can see the wetter conditions from the lower and mid-Mississippi River Valley extending through the eastern Corn Belt into New England. There will be an active Canadian storm track through here, and our greatest risk of staying drier is farther to the west here in the plains. Okay, real quick on temperatures, we do see today we have um, heat advisories that stretch from Texas all the way into New England, and there's red flag warnings on the back side of this here in parts of the Pacific Northwest. But the temperature pattern is pretty volatile. Ready? Here's today's highs going into tomorrow. See the next heat wave coming into the northern plains? That extends into the western Corn Belt by Friday. But you know there's that front coming through here on Saturday. And it's also going to be on Saturday that we start to see the transition in the northwest going back over to warmer temperatures. In fact, we'll have that front coming through the midsection of the country while there's heat in the northwest and in New England and still a lot of upper 80s and low 90s right here in this section of the country. As we go forward into Monday and Tuesday, that next wave of heat comes out. And that five-day sliding window I like to show you so much really just reveals where the ridge will set up over the desert southwest going toward the middle of this month increasing the risk of high temperatures from the plains back toward Montana. And that seems to be where the greatest risk of staying hotter than average is going to be. And the long range models have been clued into that for a while. If you do get a chance to read today's report, I, I do give a discussion about some international weather things we're talking about, primarily across parts of Europe and over in China and India. This is just a vegetation health index change map compared to a year ago. I link it in the report. And I also pull up the latest uh, root zone soil moisture map 
uh, throughout Asia, just to look at where there could possibly be some problems uh, in, in some of the big growing areas throughout Asia. But I'm going to stop there. I appreciate uh, your time this morning, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow. Thanks.